exception. And I think it's, you know, regardless of which database you use or which, you know, um, platform you're running, people just assume more is better. Okay, so if we're going to add resources or we're going to add capacity, it's going to get better. And that's going to solve all of our problems. But in a lot of cases, that's not true. Okay, um, for instance, you have the uh, per thread buffers. So the read buffer, the read read buffer, the join buffer, the sort buffer, these can be allocated per thread in MySQL. Well, if you set these to 128 megs and all of them, all of your threads need that, that's quite a bit of memory you're sucking up. So you're going to kill yourself in performance. And I've seen this a few times. Um, also, I've seen people who have like a 64 gig box and they'll set it to be 64 gigs devoted to the NODB buffer pool. So there's nothing left over for the OS. Again, not a great idea. So you want to make sure that you reserve some of the memory for the OS. Okay? Um, and you want to avoid swapping, obviously. Okay? <coughs> All right. So talking about the per thread numbers, uh, this is an interesting kind of use case that kind of goes to it's not just over allocation of memory. Um, in, back in 2007, I was with Monty Taylor um, at a client site. And they actually had set their um, sort buffer, read buffer, to something really, really high. Okay, it was, you know, I don't know, it was 32 gigs or, or 32 megs or something like that. And um, what we noticed was um, when we set those lower, the CPU actually dropped substantially out of the box. And we found out, looking through the code, that it actually changes the memory allocation for those threads when you set it above 256K. So it's a much more efficient memory allocation logarithm when you have it set to something below 256. So <coughs> if you look down here, you have the times uh, to allocate that memory. And you can see, you know, you're about you know, 30 um, micro per milliseconds versus almost a full second to do some of that allocation in this particular heart rate. So here's the O profile. I don't know how many people have used O profile, but if you have some really Deep, nasty, you know, performance problems. O profile can um, give you some insight into this. But you can see here um, with the five meg read buffer, you have the mem set taking 25 percent of the CPU, and with 128k, it's only taking 15 percent to do that same uh, kernel mem set. <coughs> now, you know, we don't want to over allocate. Yeah, the previous slide was a like same workflow, right? Yes, same workflow. Yeah. Um, it was a, there was actually more calls because we ran it longer, but it was the same workload. Um, okay, so you also, this is obvious probably to anybody who's here. I really hope that you don't leave your my CNF set as default. But I throw it up there because some people actually, you know, have had the problem of, hey, we just leave it as default too. But hopefully you're not one of those people. Um, and also, more is not always better in terms of indexes and space, okay? Um, there is kind of this growing movement that you have to hang on to everything. It's like the pack rats of the IT industry, right? So all we want to do is we want to hold on to the, you know, every piece of data we've ever collected for forever. And a lot of times the usefulness of that data kind of ages out and people don't age out that data. So, you know, do you really need data for seven years, 10 years, 15 years? Do you really need data for the last year? And you need it at the same granularity. Okay. So those are questions that you really have to ask yourself because storing that data has a cost. You know, it's not only disk space, but it's also you know potentially uh, performance and as well as you know, memory space that you have to go back and read it. All right. So we talked a little bit about the swap earlier. I just mentioned it, but um, one of the big things here is um, there's kind of some really smart people out there who have been condoning turning swap off completely. Okay. That's generally a bad thing, and when I go into client sites that actually have turned swap off, generally they're paying the price for it because when you don't have swap on and you have to swap, the process dies. If you have swap, the process is really slow and it can be, you know, close to unusable, but at least your application hasn't just stopped working. So there's a trade-off there. Um, so you don't want to do that. But uh, swappiness, how many people here have heard of swappiness on Linux? The Linux kernel will actually um, swap out user or, pro or uh, process space to preserve memory for the file system. Okay, so for file system cache. So
So you can actually, if sloppiness is set to 60, which is the default, it means reserve some amount of space for the file system cache. So you can swap MySQL out to preserve space for file system cache, which in most cases you don't want to do. So we recommend generally setting that to zero. Also, getting back to the uh, over allocation of memory, you want to make sure that you don't swap that. The prop directory is just like a report on the current status of it. Where do you actually set that? You can just you can just echo zero to that, and then we'll over set it. So it overrides it, and then when you reboot the system, you have to do that again. Yeah, or you set it in uh, sys control, like the the com. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so now we get into the boring stuff that everybody uses: uh, data size and text <clears throat> and you know data types. Uh, this is kind of most people are like that. Yeah. You know, who cares? It's, it's boring, right? Uh, but uh, actually, it's uh, very, very, you know, uh, it can have a very, very big impact on performance, okay? You know, uh, text fields. One of the key things about text fields that most people don't realize is that certain operations in MySQL require text fields to be used uh, disk-based temporary tables as opposed to memory-based temporary tables. So if you're building a lot of temporary tables, you could get a ton of temporary tables built for disk just because you're using a text field. And that can cause some severe I.O. issues and other performance issues. So um, we typically recommend that you know, if you're using just a regular text, which is 64K, can you use a var char? A var char has the capability to go to 64K, but uh, row in ODB or in MySQL can only go to 64 uh, kilobytes. So you can only have one column if you did that. But a lot of people can have a you know, 16K bar char as opposed to the 64K because they just choose text because, oh, well, we might have something really large. Don't you have the same problem, though, with a text field that goes to 64K? No, uh, text fields are stored out of row. Uh, so they're not actually stored in the row, whereas the bar char is, and the bar char can be um, aggregated and things in memory. Which is actually, you know, a good reason not to, you know, the difference of using te tiny text versus var card 255. Some people are like, well, what's the difference? That's the difference of var card 255. Assuming other things, it, it could right. be stored in the same row, depending on the size of Great. Yeah. other things in the row. Um, the other thing that most people um, don't realize is uh, the evilness of the Ruby and the select star. Um, when you have these giant text fields, I just thought I'd throw that out there, is uh, Rails and Active Record likes to select star and everything. So sometimes you have this giant blob of data that's you know some huge text field, and Ruby will select everything, even though you don't necessarily want the application to display that. So that's hurt a lot of people as well. All right. So um, you know we we've, we've talked a lot at this conference. If you've sat through the indexing panel kind of moved a little bit towards uh, you know, disk I.O. And, and some of the hardware type issues. And you've probably heard in a few different sessions about how you know, I.O. is bad. Um, and you want things in memory. And you know, faster is, is better if it's in memory. And I'm going to talk more about I.O. in a little bit here. <coughs> but one of the key things to ensuring that your database is performing properly and it's set up to be performant when you get larger is to think about your data types and think smaller data types. Okay, you want to choose something that's appropriate. You don't want to over allocate. Now it's fine and dandy to think, you know, oh, I'm going to have, you know, a, a big int goes to, you know, uh, trillions of, of records. It's great to think that you're going to have trillions of orders, but realistically, you know, the eight and a half, you know, billion that uh, records <coughs> can go to probably is enough for you, and you can save, you know, quite a bit of space over the long haul because. So you want to make sure that you use the more compact data types because that means you're going to be able to fit more rows into memory as well as have a smaller footprint on disk. Now, one of the key things in NODB, we'll talk a little bit about this in a little bit, is their indexes, their primary key indexes are clustered. So they're stored on disk based on whatever the primary key index is. And every subsequent index you create has that index in it as well. So it has the primary key as a pointer back to disk. Okay, so in that case, if you have something that's let's say a hundred byte, you know, primary key, every other index has the hundred byte primary key included. So even if you just have like a tiny int or like a male-female column, 
it would then have to have a primary key index. So you're really bloating your database if you use giant data types. So here's some suggestions. Okay, you know, um, you see on this column here's the you know the most common you know data type and then an alternative. You know, for instance, date time. Date time is you know very popular, uh, but uh, it's eight bytes. Don't ask me why, but if you use date and then have another column for time, each of those are three bytes, so it's six if you break it up. But eight times eight, it's just one of those funny things. Um, big ints, you know, obviously that's a really big number, and I used to say no one would use it, and then I was actually at a gig at NASA at one point and they hadn't used it, so I can no longer say that. Um, but the, you know, if it's unsigned, you can go up to four and a half billion, so typically that's good enough. But that saves four bytes. You know, text, obviously we talked about quotes and decimal points. <clears throat> All right, so just some general reminders around this, okay? Um, how many people use unsigned variables? Okay, okay. Um, typically most people don't use negative numbers. Some people do, but using unsigned can give you a lot more space. You know, so you, you'll have a lot more growth room if you use small ends or you know regular ends. Uh, you know, don't think that the int one means one byte. You know, hopefully everyone here knows that. Um, you know, enums. You know, those those are great if you can use them. Um, let's see, uh, big ints. Um, I've seen this a couple places. Actually, the guy who I first saw this with was a PhD from MIT. He was in school, but he had this giant um, big int. And he used it as a giant bit mask. And you know, whenever they query the database to look for male female, which was in the eighth position, you know, um, of this bit mask, it would be really slow because you can't index that effectively do bit wise math with math on it. Um, IP addresses, this is a huge one. Okay. Um, IP addresses are a big waste of space. So use uh, IDEN Anton, which converts it to an integer representation. Um, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about indexes with hash values in a little bit, but um, instead of having like a varchar index, um, you know, let's say over name or something like that, you can actually take that and you can build like a um, CRC32 hash over and use that to reduce the number of records if you store that in databases. When you pull it out, do you have to use a converse function? To yes. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's actually A to N, and then there's I net N to A. So it's address to number, and then number to address. So, um, so going along with uh, with that a little bit, uh, you know, avoid endless name conversions, okay, or or data conversions. Um, for instance, you know, a lot of times people just explicitly will do this type of thing where they'll say, oh, well, where the lower name equals Matt. If you need that, store it in lowercase in the database. Um, there are no function-based indexes in MySQL. So, you know, it doesn't have the capability to determine, you know, oh, you know, I can use this index for, for that. Okay. Um, let's see what the next one is. Um, <coughs> let's see. So, avoid implicit conversions as well. And I'm going to show you why in the next slide. Um, and if you're going to store numbers, store them as numbers and not bar charts or character fields. Um, so, ran into a couple problems, and this is just generally on really big sites, this makes a big difference um, when you have implicit versions. I mean, how many people here, uh, I know I do even, you know, you build this web application and you single quote your integers, right? Because if a value doesn't come through, you know, you want to make sure that it doesn't fail. So, you know, you go ahead and throw that in there, and then if, if nothing was passed, then all of a sudden it works great. Um, it, it doesn't fail. However, you know, when you really start looking at the numbers, you know, it seems relatively small, but there is a cost, and it's like, you know, 10-ish, 20-ish percent overhead on really simple things here. But imagine if you've got millions and millions and millions of queries running against the system. So, you know, here you look, you know, the, the, the top person at the bottom, you know, that's what, uh, 10 microseconds or something, something, you know, relatively small, but 10 microseconds times, 
you know, you know, hundred thousand selects a minute times you know the course of the day, and you end up you know wasting an entire CPU just doing you know um, conversion. So. Now there's also um, what I call like the ver reverse conversion here. All right, everybody knows that if you don't quote your your variable, it's going to fail. For instance, you know, select my test where name equals Matt. You know, I didn't quote Matt, it fails. But if you do that same thing with an integer, it actually works. So I've run into this a few times where you know they have an integer, they store it as a character field, or they store it as a bar chart, and they haven't quoted the integer field, so they haven't done the evil quotes that I just mentioned. However, in this case, since it was a text field, it then has to do a conversion to a character field, and then it doesn't use an index even if there is an index on it, because it has to do that conversion. So you want to avoid this as well. Um, ran into this at quite a few places, actually, it's surprising. It would be kind of nice if uh, it was a switch in the database, you could turn off that. <laughs> yes, it would be. Yeah, it, it, I don't think there is. I don't think there's a sequel mode for it, but uh, yeah, it, it, that would be nice. Because it seems like it's something that should be intuitive, that it should fail without quoting you know, the, the character field. Um, one of the other things, and this is more of a pet peeve than you know, uh, anything horrible, but um, I see a lot of <coughs> left outer joint love. Okay? People love left outer joints. They, they think that they're like, you know, needed for the system, you know, for, for any, you know, type of operation. And typically the end, the reason is because they want to make sure that they don't miss any data, which seems kind of odd. But uh, this is generated a lot of times by LRMs, do this a lot. But uh, you have this left outer join where you actually negate the use of the left outer join. So uh, B is the outer join table in this case. Okay. And you say, okay, well, so show me everything in B that's null. But then in the where clause, you say where B equals something. So you just removed all the nulls. So there was no point in actually doing the left outer joint. It's just annoying. How much does it cost you? Um, it's, it's probably relatively minor, but I mean, if you're still doing the join and returning the values and then you know, processing it after. I haven't done benchmarks on that, but it's just, like I said, more of a pet peeve. Um, the other thing that I've seen, especially with um, ORMs, is, let's see, is this? Oh, um, well, th this is probably what you wanted to do in the first place, is, is this first query here, which is put the B equals something in the join clause, so you'll actually get the return balance. <coughs> now, um, one of the things that I have seen occasionally with ORMs especially is they'll do joints that aren't needed. For instance, here you have this joint A and B. Okay, so it's a left joint. But then you only select things out of A. So realistically, so anyway, so realistically, um, you know, you're, you're not selecting anything out of B, so you really don't need to join B at all. And so you're joining needlessly. And that I've seen have a huge impact, you know, on systems, because sometimes you're joining to this table that's a monstrous thing. Um, very, very common in hibernating environments to see this. In what? Hibernating. Hibernating. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I said, a lot of people, they just love left outer joints because they want to make sure they don't miss anything. And as I said, most of these come from ORMs. So, and when a developer sees an ORM, they get all happy because they don't have to write SQL. And so they're like, yay, no SQL. And they get all, you know, you know, happy. And then the DBA sees it and they go, oh my god, it's an ORM. Eyes bulge out of their head. And, you know, like, you know, oh, that's going to be horrible because I have no control over the SQL. <coughs> so, as a DBA or as someone who actually cares about this stuff, um, you have to make sure that you trust that the ORM is doing what's there, but you have to verify it. So doing things like logging the queries and then running them through like MK Query Digest to determine, hey, you know, what kind of bad queries are coming out of this, running some explain plans, looking for those types of left outer joint type things, those are going to be important. Okay? For a, when you preach to your developers, make sure you tell them, hey, it's okay to not use the ORM in some cases. 
you know, because there's like this fear that when you have data models in, let's say, you know, an active record, you know, system, that, oh, if I break out a data model and use like a 5 by SQL or a 5 by raw SQL, then it's going to be horrible. Well, no, no. You're going to have to do that, okay? You know, there's just some things that, you know, active record or hibernate aren't built for. Okay. Um, views and procs in these cases can be helpful as well. So one of the things that I've done in a lot of rail shops is actually create a view and then use that as the model. Okay, so you can actually use that and um, just completely avoid um, having to worry about table joints and things because you can do the joints underneath the scenes, um, behind the scenes with the view. Um, and in Active Record, um, and this is also the same with Hibernate, but you know, things like eager loading can really help. And sometimes um, you'll see pages, so you, you know, need to make sure you watch your page loads that have like 10,000 queries because it will do really dumb things like loop through a lookup table. So it'll say, oh, well give me, you know, 5,000 order rows, but then for order rows you want to look up like a product type, and then that product type has, a, you know, let's say 10 rows, and it will loop through that for every product. What type of load time do you see on pages like that? Um, I actually was working with uh, uh, somebody who did like online testing, and uh, they had like a uh, test that they did that. Um, you know, it was like, you know, hey, we'll build this test dynamically. And they had, I think it was 14,000 queries on one page. And it was at about 16 second load time. And just by removing the logic to do the loop and, you know, breaking out of, like, here, you know, the, the ORM and building the SQL directly, we still could eliminate the, all the ORMs. We got it down to about 2,000 queries. It, it, it's still a lot, but it went from 16 seconds down to two seconds. And it was the same logic, it was just, you know, took some of the logic out, you know, the, the queries out of the ORM and put them directly into, you know, like find my SQL and then did the logic ourselves. So it can be huge overhead. Um, one of the other things, jumping back to the database side, is um, another common thing is mixing storage and views. Um, a lot of people need MySAM and need NODB for various things. Typically MySAM's uh, still used a lot for full text indexing. Uh, but uh, when you join the two, you're going to get the worst of both worlds. So you have to realize that as you know you start looking at other storage engines and you start to incorporate them in the same database, you know, when you do the join between these, uh, things might not always happen like you expect. So you know just a you know quick note on that. Also realize that you're going to have to split memory configurations and things. So you know I, I've been at client sites that have you know a giant you know, my ISAM, you know, schema and then a giant NODB you know, schema on the same database. And they have to split their memory down the middle because they can't share the same memory space. So let's start talking a little bit about indexing. Okay. Um, now, I hope nobody here actually does the solo index. <laughs> because the solo index is just, you know, horrible. But I've seen it, you know, uh, quite a few times. Um, you know, where every column has an index. Um, and my MySQL, you can't actually um, utilize that effectively. There are merge indexes, so you can actually merge two indexes in some cases, but the overhead of doing that is really, really horrible. Um, so typically you want to use concatenated indexes, and those are okay to use. Okay? Also, with uh, large number of indexes, you're going to slow down inserts and updates and deletes, so you want to make sure that you avoid that as well. But more importantly, you're going to blow memory and you're going to blow your disk space. Okay, so a lot of this gets back to you want to effectively use your memory and you want to avoid having to do disk access. So the more indexes you have, the potential more memory is being wasted by storing those indexes. So you want to avoid that at all possible. Um, also, a lot of times you have redundant indexes. You want to remove those, obviously. So uh, primary key in ODB, um, this, is, this is a huge one. So when you're actually using in ODB, um, you want to make sure that you effectively choose the proper uh, primary key. Uh, primary key is sorted on disk order, which means that you can actually play some tricks with the primary key if you have to. For instance, if you're always searching, let's say, via date and the primary key, by putting the date first, you can make sure that all of your date-related data is in the same sectors on disk. 
So when you go to scan that and retrieve that, you're going to retrieve it very quickly because it's all on this at the same locations. Um, so that's why sometimes if you're going to use like an auto increment ID, but you're really not going to use the auto increment ID, you know, um, it, as much as let's say, you know, scan for a date range or scan for some sort of type. Um, see this a lot with like gaming companies where you know they have like some sort of you know virtual pet or something where you know oh we're looking for someone to compete against. Uh, they'll have tables that you know have like a type of pet or a level or something, and that search for more than actually the ID of that direct you know thing. And when you change that, you can get like 20% performance improvement by saying okay let's put the levels together, let's put the pets types together. Um, Text-based indexes are bad, okay? Um, especially with the primary key. Um, the primary key, I've seen this in numerous places, especially with high rank again. So, you know, again, we go back to the ORMs, where they love to use GUID IDs, right? So, you know, automatically generated, you know, um, IDs. These can take up a huge, huge amount of space. Um, so there are 32 characters, okay? If you're using UTF-8, that's going to actually load it even more. Okay, so, you know, now all of a sudden you're going to have three bytes per characters, okay? And since the primary key is duplicated in NODB, you know, you're actually going to have that in every subsequent index. So if you imagine you have a 10 million row table, five indexes, I mean, you know, you're using four and a half gigs of space for that. Whereas if you used a big int instead, it would only use 400, so that's a, 4.1 gig to load to have a good ID. And again, this gets back to, you know, having too much data that, you know, you're, you know it's coming out of this into memory. And in that memory space, you're going to have all kinds of issues with trying to, you know, maintain that amount of memory uh, for, uh, for these primary keys and other indexes. <coughs> so, you know, it, and it always does get back to the I.O. issue. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard this over and over again, that it is always, you know, an I.O. issue, okay? Um, you know, any engagement that I go on, my number one goal is to reduce the, you know, amount of data being read to or from disk. And we do that various ways. One of the ways, obviously, like I've said, is reduce what you're asking for, okay? Um, now, so, I, I, I've had this question, and I posted this um, a long time ago, you know, that, hey, it's always an I.O. issue. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, people argue that, well, no, no, what if you don't have a giant database that all fits into memory? But I.O. is not just disk, okay? There's more to I.O. than just disk. So, you know, if you read the wiki uh, implementation, there's a lot of different types of I.O. way to think about it, but yes, you know, like, you, you, you come into the top and you come out somewhere else, you know, it's, it's I.O. Um, but things like, you know, if you're in line somewhere, you know, that's definitely the same thing as I.O. You know, um, you know, if disks can't read the blocks fast enough, yes, that's I.O. But what about network throughput? You wouldn't think of that as I.O., but really you're transferring from one point to another, so you're moving data across. But it, it, you know, it is an I.O. issue. You don't have enough throughput. So what you have to focus on is reducing, and that's why you know we've said, hey, reduce the data sizes, reduce what you're asking for. This here, that that is huge. Reduce what you're asking for. I was actually at a giant, you know, uh, uh, internet site out in Silicon Valley, and um, they had a lot of data that was flowing between their systems. And what we found was they were doing, you know, selecting, you know, like 50 columns, um, and they really only needed two. So they had like these 48 columns that they selected out of their database. And then in the application server, they threw away 48 of them. Well, you know, we reduced those 48 that they that they you know didn't need anymore, and we saw like a 30% jump in performance because hey, we reduced the amount of data that we were asking for. So it could actually you know send the data quicker over the network. It could actually retrieve just based on the index, you know, the, the values as opposed to having to retrieve everything. Um, one of the tricks to you know reduce you know, network I.O. is to use stored procedures, you know. Stored procedures keeps the data local. So if you're going to have an application 
that has like a lot of logic in it. You might, you know, select your data, pull it over to the application, start, you know, processing it, and then throw it back to the database. Well, that's network latency going back and forth. Um, another big one is pre-summarizing your data. Okay, and this is one of those things that people don't really think about in terms of I/O, but when you go through and you build like an aggregate, you want to count something or you want to do a sum on something, you have to retrieve all the data out of you know, disk, and then you have to process it and aggregate it, and then you can retrieve the one value. But if it's already pre-calculated, you've just reduced the amount of records that you need to satisfy that. <coughs> Certainly more hardware can help, but it's not always the answer. Okay. Um, in terms of disk I.O. though, um, you know, a lot of people still think, you know, and I know when you go to work with the hosting provider, they ask you for how much disk capacity do you need. Um, they don't ask you for spindles. Okay, they don't ask you for how much, how many IOs a second you need. But it does matter. This quick graph is just, you know, when you have data in memory versus data on disk, you can see, hey, when it's in memory, it performs better, right? So, or when it's on a faster disk, it performs better. So this compares um, regular disk to solid state disk. So you can see, hey, look, solid state is faster, but you know, you know, it's still when you have more in memory, it's still better. And it's all about concurrency with a lot of these applications now. So um, run into a lot of clients who benchmark their application and they think that, oh, we can support these millions and millions of transactions. But a lot of the time, when they benchmark, they benchmark with you know, a very small subset of actual clients generating load. They don't benchmark the throughput of the system. So they don't say, OK, well, if we had 20,000 users generating this load, as opposed to 10 users, what is the impact going to be? And so you, know, you end up having kind of like a false hope or you know, like the warmness inside that says, oh, we can handle millions of whatever. And uh, a lot of times they can't because they haven't tested the throughput of the system. And you know, even with fast disk, okay, you know, over here is solid state. Um, this is done a while ago. But you can see as you add threads, performance decreases. Okay. So I mean, yeah, you know, throughput does matter. Um, another big common problem that I run into is People who assume that a lot of their systems are black boxes or they don't kind of plan things out properly. Uh, file system LUN layout, you know, this might seem like something minimal. And, you know, you're probably not going to get a huge performance impact um, by choosing the wrong file system layout. But you could potentially run into problems. For instance, I've seen people who just have one giant big root directory. And with one giant big root directory, um, they end up filling up temp, or they end up filling up the log space, and it freezes the database because their database files are on that same you know, file system. So you know, try and think you know, before you lay out your system. You know, think you know, where you want your data to go. Um, another one is you know, just assuming that anything is a black box. You know, not just a stand, but uh, this is very common, especially in enterprise environments where you know, you've got a storage administrator or someone, they come out and they say, hey, wait a minute, the SAN is good, it's great, we pay EMC a million dollars or something ridiculous. We don't need to worry about disk I.O. And that's not always the case, okay? Um, I know EMC has this technology, and uh, I've run into this a few times where they actually move hot data from one disk to another behind the scenes, okay? And they have these, you know, like a four gig chunk and they'll move it around. Well, when it, we were at one site where they actually started moving that data around, and wherever it moved, that application would actually get horribly bad. So, you know, oh, it moves from, you know, this disk to this other disk. Oh, now this other application's having a problem. It moves to this other disk. Oh, now this other application's having a problem. It moves to this other disk. Oh, this other application's having a problem. Because they kept on moving hot to something else, and it would cause an impact elsewhere. So, even though it's smart, you know, it's not a live box. Um, and this one, I've run into a few times, but it's not, you know, uh, not horrible. But uh, self-induced fragmentation. Um, I don't know. There's still kind of a mentality, especially from old Oracle DBAs and DB2 DBAs, who like to put smaller data files um, out there. You know, there used to be, you know, file limits and how big the files could get. So they'll actually break up their inner DB data, data files to 
several small pieces and small chunks. And you can actually cause self induced fragmentation that way. So when you go and scan an index or something, it might be over 30 files. So I went ahead and set up a test um, where I ran several different queries that were going to hit a lot of these different um, data files. So um, with the exception of one, which I'm not sure why, every one of the ones that hit one data file versus the 40 you know, caused self induced fragmentation actually uh, saw an increase in performance with the one where it didn't have to scan them all. So uh, one client I ran into had like over 100 2 gig files. So it was just one of these really crazy, crazy things. But anyway, so uh, you know, those are just a few of the blunders that I've run into. Those are just a few of the blunders that I've run into. Um, so uh, you know, hopefully you can learn from some of those.